we're we're on. Um, so, so let me know if you need a hand with any of that. I've, I've done a number of different, <coughs> different information architecture pieces. Um, so I, I can work my way through some of the categorization and pattern sensing um, to try and help provide a bit of structure if that helps. Um, that would be cool. I think, yeah, uh, there are many other priority things that uh, we're focusing mm. on. And this is more like, you know, one of those wanna uh, projects. And we have many yeah. of those actually, like one of the things that I would love to solve is the actual onboarding and matching people by the skills to relevant tasks. Like obviously right now it's being done manually, but it's well positioned for, you know, AI system. It is an optimization mm. problem by, by itself. So, you know, hmm. there are many of these potential uh, tools that we can create uh, when we get some some more free time. Yep. But yeah. Yeah, look, at, at the, the issue at the moment is tackling the highest priority and the earliest in a dependency chain as well. Um, yep. I know that when we built the crisis app, onboarding did become a problem for us as we were trying to rapidly scale. Uh, and I'm seeing the same thing um, with um, Corona Y as well. Just, just grappling with how you bring people on who are coming from very, very many different tribes uh, of understanding where they don't necessarily have a shared language and uh, shared understanding. So the earlier we can get them understanding what each tool does and why we use that tool. Um, yeah, I mean, we, that, we that got contribution all, process becomes. all kinds of languages, you know, tax speak, mad speak, uh, mm. like we're soon going to touch some golf speak and fad speak and other type of languages that we're not yet ready to to encounter and translate to but yeah that, mm. that is a, a common problem just the multi-disciplinary uh you know communication as as a problem by itself it's it's very tough and i can see that in the past weeks i've radically transformed my you know language and communication patterns to basically mm. you know immediately understand the the level of abstraction that people operate on, like address as many people on the call in terms of, you know, um, trying to hit the common understanding. And especially when you're talking to, you know, almost 900 people, it's hard to, to explain mm -hmm. everything in the, in the same level, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. So having a, having a backlog and a project issues log that we can triage, and prioritize would really help with that. Uh, I've just been keeping an eye as I've been going through the different Git repositories um, and the Trello boards as well to see where those sorts of project controls are so that we can try and get a little bit of a handle on what's highest priority uh, and where there's dependencies uh, and dependency chains to be able to tackle the things that are highest in the dependency chain. Um, so yeah. I'll, I'll, move out, I'll move out of lurking mode into action mode fairly soon. Uh, but I spend a lot of time just sitting and doing some pattern sensing first before I, I take any kind of action. As, uh, as many people actually, you know, that's the nature of this project. Whenever you're onboarded, you're kind of overwhelmed and there is this major information overload, but then the mm -hmm. system kind of picks you up by, by some emergent structure and just, you know, you, you, it, it becomes viral. You become a part, part of this movement. It's, mm -hmm. it's quite inspiring. But yeah, um, so it's, I think it, it's not it's nice not having the pressure of something like a fifty four hour hackathon. Um, that true, which is the which is the sort of stuff that I've curated in the past um, because you you ultimately hit a, a rate limiting point where you go okay I've just got to time box this I can't sit back and pattern sense anymore now we've got to take action. Uh, at least having this as a, a longer challenge does give you a chance to be able to do a little bit more of that. Um, and not have quite the same level of strict time boxing, uh, but but it's a lot. There's a lot of new patterns that are still emerging from the work that's being done as well. Uh, I can see there's lots of pivots that need to happen as we we try different things and pivot yeah. to the next experiment. Every day, it's a giant science experiment. Like we ideate some structure mm. today and we throw it away tomorrow, and we pick up the, the pieces that we're working and we're building on top of those. And it's crazy because it, it feels like already like six months in the typical, you know, and <laughs> company environment. And now like it's, it's only been two weeks and it's again, like we measure time in coronavirus years, which are way, way different than typical uh, time. So mm -hmm. yeah, very exciting stuff. 
uh, tell me about um, like the ideas that you shared about the um, open data uh, stuff are are definitely uh, interesting. I would love to uh, explore your perspective on first of all, you know, possibilities and also the unique uh, timing that we're living through and how to you know possibly help guys like Sander and Wout to try and position this. Um, to get maximum, you know, positive outcome. Because obviously we're we're not going to hit this magical state where uh, all of a sudden everyone in the healthcare community is willing to um, to kind of uh, produce the system that is all about uh, data sharing. Mm. There's got to be some gradual adoption or something. Yeah, so it, it's interesting for me when I think about the things that I've tried within my own med tech startup and the things that I've been exposed to over the years of standards development in the e-health space. Um, <coughs> because previously, they were often nation state led initiatives. Um, so you would see that Australia would take a particular approach to its e-health architecture. Um, so we've got a, a personally controlled electronic health record here. Um, it took them a long time to work out that they needed to turn that into an opt-out rather than an opt-in system to be able to get the scale of operation that they needed. Um, the US has a different uh, federated model with their integrated health exchange uh, that relies a lot more on interoperability uh, of records. But you think about the volume of cash that's been spent on creating electronic medical records in each of those different countries, and often they'll have no way of being able to interoperate uh, at an international level. They might work fine within the jurisdiction that we're talking about, but we see even here in Australia just going state to state and jurisdiction, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, sometimes you just don't get the interoperability you need. Where a lot of that started to change is when you get the big platform players like Apple and Google and Fitbit coming in that effectively have a multinational presence uh, and they have the enabling uh, biodata sets based on the things that you pick up from a wearable. Um, and we've seen within the standards development space that there is much more of a drive to working with the data that people generate within their own wearable and their own device, uh, recognising that there's value in that. It mightn't necessarily have the same fidelity as an ECG that they get from uh, a six-point harness in an ICU, um, but there's still a level of quality and fidelity that can be used as part of the, uh, the health record and catch-up. But Working out how to position that as an open data set um, where the data is owned by the individual uh, is the un the uncracked nut. I've seen a few different architecture patterns that have tried to play with it. Um, so we've seen a number of different attempts at it through blockchain. Um, I've seen a couple that have tried to position data as an asset uh, that's monetizable by the individual that actually rewards them for the sharing of it. Um, I mean, ultimately, we're, if you look at the platforms of freemium software where we're contributing our own data and our own privacy by participating in the platform like Facebook, um, people just aren't aware of the amount of data that they're sharing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so th there's nothing in life that's for free uh, when it comes to data. So you either pivot it and turn it away from the platform operator back to the individual and say, okay, these are the things that I want to have control over. Um, which might be core biodata. You might have preference data that sits out on the side that relates to a hobby, but you think, okay, for a marketplace that's interested in that data, then yes, you could um, you could monetize that. Um, but the fundamental constraint that we're moving from is the sense of ed electronic med medical records as something that's owned by the healthcare institutions because they're the ones that are um, forking out for the system implementations. Uh, and it's, it's the same as the adopters' medical records when they're sitting on paper files. They used to be the, the asset that was owned by the medical practice. And it takes a while for that paradigm to shift. Um, but ultimately, if I think about some of the, the data that we've been experimenting with within MindMate Ventures and what we're trying to do with CleanMate, um, we're talking about fairly sensitive data because when people are trying to actively grapple with an, a problem of addiction, uh, they might be dealing with illicit substances that they're addicted to, then naturally the first time they encounter a service that they might want to try and use to get some help with that problem, they don't want to engage with that in an identity-declaring de identity way. So 
they're typically going to want some anonymity or pseudonymity. Uh, now that becomes really hard for us to try and have a persisted record for. Um, so we might be able to have one encounter uh, with someone and we'll be able to have a session record that captures a bit of information about the extent of the addiction, the, the vector of it, um, what's the substance of, of concern. Uh, but we can't persist that from one record to another and build a picture uh, of how a person's habit changes over time. Um, so there's kind of three phases to the, the way that we've explored that. So there's a preclinical phase where people do have low levels of trust uh, and you know, high levels of uh, privacy concern. Um, and that's really we've got to support people through that. But then you might get into your more of a clinical engagement stage like you might see in a rehab centre uh, where they are under clinical supervision and they're getting um, perhaps some supplementary uh, medication to help them uh, with withdrawal and craving. Um, and it's on the flip side of that. It, so that, that becomes the start of a privacy identifying and identity uh, identifying uh, data set. And then you go to the other side of it, which is post-clinical, where we're looking to see how a person can stay strong in the development of those new uh, avoidance behaviours. Uh, and that's when identity becomes really important because we do need to be able to help track uh, behaviour change over time. Um, but the data set that we're dealing with is something that's attractive to people as well. Um, so in terms of nation state actors, they look at it and go, okay, here's a node in a network that we can start to trace uh, when we're trying to track down you know, cr criminal syndicates. Um, so you, you can see very quickly how nation states want to start to get their fingers into the information pie. Um, the issue for us is that we're trying to provide this as a healthcare service uh, and within healthcare, you need to be able to have a position of trust that you're operating from. Um, so if you can't provide trust within a system design, uh, then you, you're kind of failing from day one. Um, so these are some of the conundrums that we've been wrestling with in what I've been trying to do within CleanMate. So I, I keep looking at different data models to go, okay, how can we position the data as something that's owned by the individual, reward them for the contribution, um, help provide motivation and reward schemes around how they use that data and contribute data, but also protect it uh, with adequate safeguards. Um, it's the sort of thing that you know you're going to have constant countermeasures that you have to deploy from a, a security design um, just to try and stop it being looked at as a honeypot of really interesting information. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good point. I mean, trust is a fundamental enabler of any uh, system of such kind. Uh, that I 100% agree. And, you know, to me, it sounds like a lot of the, like, obviously the idea is grand, like it's an exciting idea, but what really drives it is the use case. And in your scenario, it's a real practical use case of helping people that experience addiction or substance abuse. And, you know, right now we may have a very, very timely use case too, in terms of, you know, analyzing the, the spread of COVID-19 or analyzing some, um, some patterns that are happening, even in terms of the, the strains, because like, not sure if you've seen that website nexttrain.org that visualizes all the possible strains that already uh, were discovered. And we have like thousands of them right now. And essentially what we're talking about is like, there is a variability in both you know the the severity and the symptoms and all kinds of uh, parameters that we're looking at and there is no effective method to you know analyze any of that essentially because it is all dependent on very granular occasional clinical trials or you know tests that are happening in a very random manner so mm -hmm. I would imagine that one of the variables is for that is also down at genomic level, um, just to be able to account for genetic variation in, in vulnerability. I, I know I've, I've seen a range of different pieces of research on recovery trajectories. Um, there was one that I tripped across from Korea last night, so that identified that I think there was about 90 cases that had been through COVID-19 infected and now they're reinfecting. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a single, single episode. So the research is still trying to come to grips with how does the virus actually behave as well? 
um, and how does that interact at, a, at both a, and, an individual level and a genomic level. Yeah, and the genome stuff is actually very interesting because we kind of have the platform that allows individuals to own that data, being 23andMe in, in US and I think worldwide. I'm not sure if they're doing, but I know there are like different companies that work with 23andMe, but basically I upload, I downloaded my uh, raw genome and I uploaded to a bunch of different tools just to experiment and explore s and and, you know, different variations of genes. And, you know, it, like even at this stage, I believe given the right use case, given the right institution to back this up and given the right cause, um, you know, guys like Sender and Wild could potentially get um, a, a million people uploading their uh, genome data from 23andMe. Um, but again, like there has to be a very valid um, cause, uh, an immense trust and credibility of, you know, people that are going to explore the use case for it. Mm. Yeah, look, I know that I've watched the, um, the 23andMe story over the, the last few years just to see how, where some of the secondary markets and risk potential comes in because you can see from for instance a health insurer's perspective um, they want to be able to understand potential vulnerabilities and variations uh, that their insured cohort are going to be exposing them to from an actuarial risk um, position um, so there's always concerns about what those secondary market intents are uh, for genomic data i've got a friend that that works at um, the garvin medical institute here in Australia, uh, he does a lot of hacking. Uh, he's got a couple of interesting mates who are biohackers as well, playing around with things like RFID implants into the under, <laughs> under skin. Um, Fun. But, but, COVID, but COVID's an interesting use case, though, when you think about um, some of the privacy declaration. And I've seen this with the CoEpi uh, team as well, where they're trying to wrestle with how you can declare you know, the fact that you have been infected or are actively uh, infected uh, and track that for uh, the contact tracing forensics. Um, so I've seen some of the some of the propositions put forward for things like Bluetooth low energy broadcasts within a, mm -hmm. uh, a private. Um, there are a couple of people that mentioned that in our Slack channel too. Yeah, yeah. So, but you you keep going back to okay. Well, what are the things that people will generally have in common? that give you the best pathway for tracing. And not everyone has a Bluetooth low energy yeah. capable phone or device. So that rules the out. The ability has to, to be there, not just motivation, yeah. but ability. Yeah, I've seen uh, the guy, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bertan, uh, I'll, I'll ping you in a, a chat after this when I track down his details. But he's been talking about some of the stuff he's been seeing out of Saudi Arabia, you know, putting a bracelet on, which is essentially an RFID tag. Um, going, okay, what's the what's the cascade of um, wearable device and uh, inferable information? So certainly for things like a mobile phone, it's a useful proxy for location. Uh, we've seen Israel, we've seen China using mobile phone geolocation as a, a proxy for movement and using all sorts of dark web methods for being able to go, okay, we know we can trace these, we know we can backward, we can work backwards for contact tracing to see where they've been. Um, it's a matter of how much individual privacy are you willing to give up for a larger community safeguard? Uh, and they're, they're very strong and active ethical conundrums that we're having to work through in <laughs> hyper-realistic time at the moment. Yeah, so see some nation states will just run rough shot over the top of privacy constraints and go. You know what? This is a break glass moment when we have to do it for the greater good of the larger community. And it, it's been interesting watching the response from individualist uh, Western cultures to um, uh, collectivist cultures like uh, some of the Southeast Asian uh, countries. Um, and you can see why it's taken off so hard in the US. It's just such a strongly individualistic yeah. culture. They just don't see that there's a benefit for the greater good. Yeah, coming from Ukraine uh, and, you know, coming from the, the basically the post-Soviet um, society, mm. I can totally see this difference between the collective environment and individualistic uh, here in US. 
And mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It makes sense why people are reacting this way. But also, like, I think people are over trained to behave in individual individualistic manner. And that's just because it, it's a byproduct of, of the current, um, you know, society, also financial system in, in a way that is is producing these side effects like the the privacy and data is genuinely considered some you know bad thing you know the the data is only bad because someone is manipulating you into watching ads or manipulating you at you know doing something for commercial purposes because that's pretty much the only ways um companies are using it like the mm -hmm. data for good almost doesn't exist and mm -hmm. like obviously that's a that's a big barrier uh to entry and like the first one you have to battle is explaining that hey you're not only gonna own your data and no one will use it for like bad purposes meaning like targeting ads but you also yeah. be enabling good purposes for that data yeah, look, at, I've been watching different countries' approaches to e-health implementations over the years, and we see that some countries go with a national identifier and a national card. Um, when we've talked about different e-health system design, having a national identifier. Like um, Estonia. Gives you, Estonia, for instance, Estonia, Denmark, I'm pretty sure Singapore uh, and Hong Kong uh, have it as well, uh, but it does, you know, Canada uh, as well. Um, I've seen implementations of this uh, within Canada, uh, but having at least a single unique identifier that you can then bolt secondary data uh, purposes to is a really core part of it. Um, so going, okay, what's that single primary key going to be that we then hang other data attributes off in a federated data model? Um, I mean, in Australia, we have proxies for it, uh, things like our local Medicare card, uh, driver's licenses, so they, they build up a national identifier based on just a federation of each of those different mm -hmm. ID mixes, um, but there's still no no single card. Um, but having something like that does give you a pretty strong foundation for trying to do some of the system design. It's just that there's so much variability internationally on approaches to that, uh, it's, it's very hard to try and find a unified model uh, for it. Yeah. If only, we, if only we all had our own persistent IP address, eh? <laughs> well, uh, our DNA might be that, except even viruses change that. So, who knows? Mm. <laughs> mm. Mm. So, um, how can I be of best help for you at this point in time? Well, I think this conversation alone will be super helpful for the channel and basically kickstarting that discussion. I am looking into, you know, finding more of these relevant people like you to add to the mix. If you have some folks that uh, basically are relevant and, um, you know, have this as a passion or passion, you know, idea, uh, please feel free to invite them into this uh, creative chaos. I do want to help Sander and, and Wild to, you know, position this, um, you know, as soon as possible. And I can also think of, of that as being, like, I have this idea of Corona Y, um, you know, b building basically a launch pad for all kinds of exciting teams and ideas beyond Kaggle, beyond COVID-19. And obviously, um, we can basically, whenever any organization or a group of people comes to us and tell us, hey, this is the exciting idea, and we validate it uh, in a collective way, uh, we should be able to supply these guys with all kinds of resources, engineers, because like building open data platform is going to take some hundreds of, of people mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's going to take some tools, some infrastructure. We can supply that. And I truly believe we can help them build this amazing rocket to launch it into the space and basically, you know, also give them fuel to overcome the, the gravity of the external world which is, you know, going to be pretty hard to to break through the current realities and the governance of data and participating mm -hmm. in infra infrastructures. So I, I'm thinking of us as being that launch pad, uh, assembling that rocket, pushing it out and letting people like them basically, you know, get some help in, in a real sense, 
because mm. like we're entering new world where these things might be possible and like I, i'm i'm just i'm trying to build this infrastructure to support that so again like i think it all starts with the bullshit talk like the the f very first week of corona y was just me going into gazillion different places and uh setting things on fire just flare here flare there and then all of a sudden you know people bump into each other and there's a fire and then there's a team and then people are working on something and that's the best thing that we can do as individuals and then this collective intelligence collective collaborative effort will emerge I did notice that we had uh, a deputy CTO of the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratories uh, in the the cohort. So yep. the the analogy isn't the analogy isn't lost on me. Um, <laughs> so I've been keeping a pretty close eye on what's been happening over in Estonia with their global hack uh, mm -hmm. over the last twenty four hours as well, because that naturally there's hackathons running left, right, and centre. Um, with different little emergent initiatives coming out of them. Now, ultimately. The trade-off within this sort of innovation work is helping people not fall in love with their own ideas so hard that it puts the blinkers yeah. on to that model's limitations and the fact that there could be something bigger for them to be able to abstract into or, or scaffold into. Um, so I'm keen to see that within the work group's activity that we do have people who are trying to do that sort of pattern sensing to see where there's there's good alignment and adjacency of effort you know, and see if it can be can turned into more of a, a, a combined impact effort. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we have a lot of kind of like abstract thinkers that are trying to solve for that. It's, it's quite hard. It's an in, intense mental effort, but I think, mm. you know, day by day we are building this, uh, you know, airplane while flying on it and yeah yeah it's definitely interesting so yeah uh, let me uh, summarize this uh, call because I, I really need to, to get some food <laughs> into my machine but yep. um basically if there are you know three people that you think would be beneficial to this uh project in particular in terms of data ownership data uh, sharing just invite them or tell them about this uh open space for ideas and let's see if, if they join. And I'll be uploading this call to a Slack channel. I'll ping Sander and, and Wout, and maybe we'll organize a, uh, another session with all of us together. Sounds good. All right. All right terrific. Thanks, thanks for sparing me the 30 minutes in a, in a hectic day. Go no enjoy, problem. Go and, enjoy, go and enjoy feeding your machine. <laughs> all right. Thanks, man. And we'll talk soon.